Good afternoon, London Calling. This was the theme of today. Uh, we are proud and happy to have you here in the studio, in addition to the audience live in the live stream at home. Looking forward for, I hope, 60 something minutes of crisp, sharp, entertaining presentation. Four very spectacular people out of our industry. The start will be made by Fabian, Fabian Heck from Sahid Architects. 15 minutes, let's see how fast we can go through the presentation on that one. After that, a facade geek of the industry will join us. It is Simone Starnini, uh, you know him by heart. Uh, he learned the hard way at the very beginning at Focky as a project manager. So he's uh, bulletproofed in the facade industry to say it like that. Then Rebecca is coming. Uh, Rebecca is the director for communication marketing of IQ Glass in MSM, but has a lot of more responsibilities for the entire IQ group. She will also talk to you then before Damien from Eckersley O'Callaghan is finishing the 60 minutes more or less sharp. Okay, so let's just uh, enjoy and relax a little bit during the evening, during that kind of nice afternoon. Why we are in London, that's maybe also a nice question because I'm representing Keller Minimal Windows. Um, I'm also having my colleague Wim with me here tonight. Um, why are we here? Because we belong to the Aluke group and Aluke has a very, very brilliant, nice design studio here in London. And it's the starting point of our activity to bring more or less this kind of nice product, nice ideas and nice design support together with IQ Glass to the British market, to the London architects, to the London designers, to the London engineering offices. Proud to be here. Let's start, not too much said, because otherwise the 60 minutes is already gone before I finish my introduction speech. Please, first on the floor is Fabian Hecker. Give him hands, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, we've just said it a little bit. We meet up and then uh, across the globe, I would even say. Huh? I mean, we, we know each other also a little bit longer than two days. Um, so, Morris, we have get a little bit gray during the past uh, five years of experience we have got in the industry. He's more than 21 years now at Sahad in Architects, so he's a really reputed architect in that area. He has a, a German Diplom Engineer degree in architecture, which is re really rare in Selm. He studied in Aachen, but came to London also to finish the landscaping architecture studies here in London. Fabian, the floor is yours, 15 minutes, more or less sharp, okay? Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you, Werner. Thank you for inviting uh, inviting me uh, to to the opening of the showroom and uh, and your presence here in London. Um, I, as you mentioned, 50 minutes. I'll do my very best to stay within within uh, the slot. There we go. Room with a view is the the topic for today. Um, I will focus on transparency. It's not very exciting when you talk about glass. It's obviously the the essence of it. But that's one of the reasons why I want to talk about that um, a little bit. So when you think about transparency in glass, obviously you associate it with the window. The window is one of the archetypes of architecture. It sits in a wall uh, and it's that part of the wall, if you like, that is not opaque, but is open and uh, allows a view out and allows uh, light to come into the room. Um, and glass, obviously, when it, uh, when it was invented, uh, maintained that function of the window, but it also allowed to keep the elements out. Uh, very basic. Um, that concept was obviously refined over the years uh, when it came to modernism and the advance of technology. Um, glass and the window uh, became something you try to you try to increase the glass, you try to dissolve the wall um, very much. And this project by Mies van der Rohe uh, in uh, the uh, Tugendhat House is called. You can see the the, the back elevation here. Um, the view out of out of the main room, and you may be able to see that not only are they uh, large window panes, but these window panes were actually designed to be lowered. So when the weather is nice enough, you can actually make these windows disappear, and the glass literally disappears. So transparency becomes actual openness. Very radical approach. Um, and the next step in that evolution of dissolving the wall and of the, for glass to take over is obviously the curtain wall. There's a project from the 1950s, sorry, 1970s, so Norman Foster, where the wall is finally completely dissolved and replaced um, by glass. And now the reason why I want to talk about transparency, that's a, it's an essay that was written in the 1960s 
uh, by uh, two American or British American scholars and architects, Colin Rowe and Robert Slutsky, and they they looked at transparency uh, from a slightly different angle. So they say there's two ways, or two, transparency can be two different things. It might be the inherent quality of, of, of a substance such as glass or a curtain wall, or it may be something more abstract like an organizational quality. And they call these different approaches um, the literal and the phenomenal uh, transparency. And that's something I found very interesting as a tool for us, because we're obviously designing and we're designing holistically, uh, taking any kind of project from the very beginning to the detail. So along the way, we, yes, we're dealing with glass uh, as a material, but we start this process much, much earlier. And um, that is a, a useful concept we find. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, what does that mean? And what's the difference maybe? Um, so also in spatial terms, uh, the glass, the idea of glass that we just discussed or that I tried to explain what we normally would associate with glass and transparency in a way can be related to a spatial concept um, which is maybe represented by, by this drawing. The ideal city, it's a, it's a Renaissance painting. It's obviously dominated by a linear perspective. Uh, it represents a space that is um, very much controlled. It's controlled and, and ordered, uh, and it's controlled by the viewer. So the focus, although one is not in the picture, the focus is the viewer, is the person, the subject. Um, it, is, uh, it is the um, enlightened subject of the Renaissance uh, and, and, and uh, the modern times. Um, you see there's a layering, uh, there's a depth in that space. You kind of can anticipate what is behind each of the elements. It's very much a focused and ordered and very static space in many ways static and controlled, as I said, from the person that this uh, painting is focusing from. Um, and if you then look at the different concept of space, which might be behind this term of phenomenal space, it's something that is may maybe more like a cubist painting where there isn't a clear perspective. The depth that we had, this illusion of depth, uh, has disappeared. Instead, there's a layering of very different angles. You know, it's a building, or a painting that is almost deconstructed and reconstructed through different angles, looking at the same object, um, but all superimposed uh, in, in, in this painting. So something that is more multidimensional, you have uh, very different angles, you have an aspect of temporality that's all of a sudden included, because you can imagine you're walking around the object and you're capturing different different views of the object in the same plane. Uh, at the same time, as I said, it's a flat space. It's non-hierarchical, uh, in my view. Um, it's multidimensional, we said that. It's multi-angular. Um, and it is, it is somewhat dynamic because it incorporates these different, um, these different perspectives. And that is interesting um, as a concept, as I say, because all of a sudden it becomes something that is maybe less confined, that is less clear, that is much, much more open um, as a concept. And there's something, it's a painting by uh, Le Corbusier uh, from 1930, um, which is much more geometric, much, much calmer, but which maybe shows a little bit the concept behind the way this space and this painting is organized, which is, as I said, is a plane, is flat. There is not even the attempt to try to uh, create a depth, but it's very different objects which are um, superimposed, overlaid of each other, they have adjacencies, but there isn't really a very clear relationship defined between them. They seem to be floating on top of each other, um, but the composition as such is very open. So these elements that you see, these abstract geometric elements, which some of them re represent objects, others maybe not, but even if they do represent something, you can see how they could be, again, deconstructed, they can they can start to interrelate in ways which are not preconceived, maybe. So something, depending on how you look at it, you maybe associate one element with another, next time you associate two different elements, and they mean something different. So it's, it's an open field um, that very much uh, has a dynamic um, a legibility maybe built in, but also as a, it's almost a map that you can use and create something new out of. And as I said, the, that's very much, it's very much achieved by superimposing these very different elements onto one plane. 
Um, and the effect is not too dissimilar um, to this figure to the, on the right. You can see figure ground. So it's two things in one, in one image, if you like. So it's either two faces or it's a vase, depending on what you look. And what is foreground, what is background isn't really clear. And it kind of oscillates between these two things, depending on how you look at it. And that, that's an interesting concept. On the, on the other side, I've put the uh, Nolly map of Rome from, 17, uh, from the 1780s. So Nolly mapped Rome, Baroque Rome at the time. And that's the traditional way of doing it. Black is the building, white is the streets. But what he did is he introduced all public spaces into that map. So you see churches, courtyards, and everything. And all of a sudden, it's not so clear anymore which is which. You know, what is a building? From what point on are you in a building? And from what point on are you still in the city, in the public space? So you could argue that it is maybe un, it's unwanted, but it has a very similar effect. And finally, uh, Zaha did uh, one of the first projects or early projects from the late 1980s uh, in Berlin, uh, the Victoria area in Kudam. You can see some similarities. Again, it's a field. It is something that um, incorporates very many different um, perspectives of the same project, kind of seamlessly in this big field. You, know, you have it from different vantage points, um, you can, but you can also sense how the project is actually developed out of this, you know, which to an extent represents the, the urban fabric um, and, and is the, is, it was the, 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 or, the origin of, of, of the development of that project, of its tectonics and everything. And it's, but it's, it's one big field, uh, again, um, where things seem to be pop, popping up. Different perspectives uh, are, are all seamlessly integrated. That may be just briefly to try and explain different uh, concepts um, of, of transparency based, based on this distinction. Now, obviously, when it comes to construction and reality, you never have it one way or the other. It's always a mix of the two things. I'm going to show two projects briefly, and I hope that here and there maybe some of the aspects that I just uh, try to explain pop up and, and, and resonate. So this is the Opus uh, project, the mixed-use project in, in Dubai, which we completed a few years ago. Um, it's in Business Bay uh, in Dubai. If you know Dubai, it's basically a city made out of small cities. Business Bay is one of them. Uh, next to the birch. Um, when we started the project in 2006, there wasn't anything uh, but what you see there, but there was a master plan, a very simple master plan. You can see three building types. Uh, we had a yellow type, type A, um, and that was, the master plan was basically a podium for parking and two towers on top. Um, this is roughly how it looked 2014 or so. You can see it's a, it's a big visual mess despite the simplicity of uh, the master plan. And the opus you can see, see up there, you see it is slightly different from all the other buildings, although they're all trying to be different desperately. So how did we achieve that? It was an interpretation of the master plan and some tweaking of the rules, let's say. So on the right-hand side, you see the base idea, podium to towers, then we said, well, what if you connect the two towers and we create a cube? Um, and then a very important thing was, what if we uh, take the parking, move it away from the ground and put it underground, liberating the ground floor? And then finally, that allows us to express the ground floor uh, in a very particular way. Um, this was the original concept program. It was ma mainly an office building with some retail on the, on the ground floors and the parking below ground. During the construction process, that changed. It had to do with the financial crash of 2008. The business model changed, and whilst there were restarted construction, we were asked to redesign the building on the inside without changing anything on the outside. So we introduced a hotel and service departments, uh, some food and beverage, a nightclub. So all that was, was happening as we were constructing superstructure. As I said before, the envelope did not change. That concept uh, was fixed. And it was from the start, it was the idea of this crystalline uh, sculptural cube. And going back in history a little bit, uh, these are two early designs of Mison de Roo skyscrapers. 
they're often quoted as the first full glass skyscrapers, ideas never, never built. Um, and as such, uh, are they relevant? But what is interesting, I think, is not so much that it is a full glass envelope, but the fact that the focus you put on it is, is not so much the glass and it's the transparent aspect alone that glass has and the idea of modernism, but the fact that they are very irregular floor plans, as you can see in the next slide, which is very awkward, you would think. Um, but the reason behind it is that he wanted to create buildings which are not only transparent, but they play with the reflection. It's become something, there's something that is sparkling, uh, something that is dynamic in its appearance, and that's very much influenced by German Expressionism at the time, uh, where glass and, and that image was, was, was very, um, very important. So this is something that I think we also have in this building. Um, the cube is defined by the master plan, not much, much we can do about it, but by, by cutting this irregular hole in the middle, we are creating surfaces which have some similarity and definitely a similar effect to what Mies uh, conceived uh, in the 1920s. Um, and so this hole that is cut in, uh, we then decided to also differentiate it with a different color of glass. Um, to make that contrast even stronger. So that is a dark blue. You can see that here in detail. Uh, and the fact this has on some of the spaces on the inside, uh, some seemingly random intersections. The other thing that we did is the outer facade, which is roughly, which is very regular. It's a clear glass. Um, we decided to add another layer onto it, uh, literally a frit pattern. Um, which wraps around the entire uh, around the entire facade. That was then translated into a series of, of patterns uh, and elements, facade elements, um, and rationalized to create this seemingly random uh, appearance with uh, with a limited uh, amount of um, uh, facade elements panels. And we decided to go for a mirror frit, and that obviously has a very very interesting effect. You can see that on the left-hand side, two of our colleagues there um, taking a, a photo of the sample and creating this uh, this really almost surreal effect of, of, of mirroring, of transparency, and and a bit of of both happening at the same time. If you if you look here, for example. Now, so kind of going back to this idea uh, of this fluctuating um, appearance. Yeah, this is just a, a detail um, and how that was applied to the, to the building. I'm just gonna take you on a little walk around the building from different perspectives and you can see uh, how it changes, uh, how the effect um, is slightly different yet consistent from all, from all sides. So you can hear the building almost disappears in the sky, the skyline seems to continue through the building. Um, this is an overlay of all the conditions we just talked about. So we have reflection, we have transparency, a reflection of the uh, surrounding, but also reflection just purely of the sun of light. Some uncontrolled reflections here on the, in the hole in the middle. The other side of the building. Yeah, and um, yeah, so that, that gives you a little bit of an idea um, how we, although we work with glass very much and it's, it is about transparency and it is about reflection, um, but we hope to have introduced something that is not just a mute tower, but something that is animated, that is lively, um, and that interacts very much uh, with its surrounding and that changes appearance, not only from the angle, but also depending on the day, and the light condition. The next project uh, is also in the region, National Build Heritage Center in Diria, in Saudi Arabia. It's a project we developed uh, together with uh, Damien, Agus Leo Callaghan, responsible for the facade. And this is very different in the sense, I'll come to that later. So Diria, just a, a brief uh, history, said as National Build Heritage Center. It's very much uh, located in the center of Saudi. It's the uh, it's the, the essence or the core or uh, the origin of the, the Saudi state uh, of, the current, of the current state. So the, uh, 
the Saud family um, originated from there. They liberated the country from there. So it is an important, uh, important uh, place in, in, in Saudi. It is just outside Riyadh in the so-called Wadi Hanifa. And it was the capital of the first Saudi state. Um, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site by now. Um, you can see the, the, the UNESCO bit here uh, in the front. Um, and we were approached, we won a competition actually to build the National World Heritage Center that was to document what's going on there, but obviously with the ambition to do that for the, all, of, um, all of Saudi. Um, this is the, the works underway uh, to restore. It's all compacted earth. Um, so it's remarkable how much was actually left, um, given that it was abandoned for the longest time. But that's obviously a clue that we took for the building. Another clue is the context, uh, the main elements here. We obviously have the, the dunes, the, the, the desert, the oasis, and then what is this explained, the direct context of this rammed earth uh, traditional construction, which we tried to wrap into a building. Um, it's a heritage building. We've had many conversations with the locals say, well, it doesn't look like one. Um, and the concept that we had, and it was ultimately also successful in the competition, is not so much trying to, to mimic a mimicry of what is there, um, but to hopefully interpret it in a contemporary way, but retaining some of the qualities that the traditional construction has. So um, these very uh, massive uh, walls that they have, obviously they have to do with, deal with the heat, small openings, is something that we took as a clue, but that's not something that you can build a, a modern building out of. So you try to replicate that effect, but using different materials, using a metal facade, um, working, with, um, working with perforation. So again, trying to play with the effect of something from a certain distance, an angle looks solid, and then if you approach from a different angle or come closer, maybe all of a sudden it starts to become porous. Um, yeah, so same concept. And you can see that here a little bit. We have the actual uh, um, thermal envelope, which is fully glazed, but a screen around it, um, which creates that effect, which obviously helps with shading and controlling uh, the temperatures. Just a detail around these openings. And how we are creating this uh, Perforation is something we worked a long time with uh, Eckersley, what is the best concept? So we ended up with this twisted, what we call the twisted fin, which is a diamond, a diamond shaped uh, profile you can see. And very cleverly, we managed to hide the substructure in between and we rotated around that bar. Um, the other thing we very much liked uh, or were interested in is this concept of the traditional Islamic city. Um, it is obviously a very dense city, and it's a typology made out of uh, courtyard houses. And what is interesting about it is that, again, we've seen it a little bit with the Nolly map before, the inside and the outside is somewhat not clear where you are. Now, you're, you're, you're outside, this looks like a city block, so here this might be a street, and you enter the block, but then are you really inside the block, or is it still a street? Um, and then you enter a courtyard, and then, yes, you enter a courtyard. Are you in the building or is it still part of the previous space? So you're constantly in a condition where you don't really know if you're outside or inside of something. And that's something that we also thought is an interesting concept we try to, we try to replicate to an extent. So we have these two volumes inside. I should say that space on the ground floor is an exhibition. So we, we took these two, we call them pebbles for the lack of a better word, but these two elements around which we have this, this snaking exhibition space and we organized the entire, entire ground floor through it. But this is, yet, is a solid that's inside this building. Um, so you can see it here a little bit, how they are organized uh, and the exhibition flows around it. But the concept very much was that you have that effect. You enter a building and then you're in this kind of in-between space. You see something else, something else solid, and you maybe find yourself on that condition between two different objects. Um, just briefly in terms of Materiality, um, something that we took the clue from the more traditional structures, obviously, and applied it. Um, this tries to show it a little bit. Now, you, you approach the building from the outside, uh, you have this effect from solid versus porous, and you enter, and all of a sudden, you see another solid object or two solid objects inside, and then you can enter them again. 
Yes, so I just take you on a tour as well from the outside. Then you are in this kind of in-between space. You've gone through the screen of the facade and, and you're seeing these strange objects inside. You can walk in them. They are somewhat they're partially closed, partially open. Um, you know, the change of material to also play with the inside and outside to make that clear. The view back, the view up, because this is organized uh, across two levels, and the view at the top. I think I leave it here because I'm I'm otherwise overrunning my welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo, for your impressive presentation. Thanks a lot. I mean, of course, I cannot leave you from stage without a question, or two or three. Maybe the audience also. Uh, straight away. I mean, it's all about the view. We've seen that the view could be transparent, non-transparent, inside, outside. But what is more important? Is it the architect's view or the occupant's view? This was not questions beforehand, so <laughs> let him time to think it over. No, I mean, obviously, we when we design, we design with the occupant or the user uh, in mind. I mean, architecture at the end of the day is a social uh, is a social art, if you want to call it like that, um, uh, and and this is all, this is what it must be all about. Um, uh, obviously, architects have particular um, passions and things they like to pursue and do. And we're not pretending to be not the author of the building. I mean, as an artist, that would be very difficult to do uh, to mm -hmm. argue that and win that argument. Um, but it is finding a balance between the two. Yes, lovely. Any more questions from the audience straight away or after a period? How do you minimize the heat from outside? Minimize the heat from outside in this last project. So um, the, the, uh, this shading screen that we put around the, um, the actual thermal envelope is very much, you know, the angles of, 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 these, um, of these twisted parts of the fins very much twisted in such a way that they follow the sun path. So we're optimizing the shading function of that envelope. It doesn't move, no, but it, you know, it, it follows the sun path and basically is oriented in such a way that, that it optimizes the, the shading function. It's a trade-off, you know, you need to let, let daylight in, but you want to keep the sun out and, um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Fabian. Okay. Much more time later on, a little bit to discuss with Fabian on that one. So old stuff sometimes works better than new stuff. Uh, you see it in front of you. Um, I'm so happy to have uh, Simone Stalini with me uh, tonight as well as the second speaker. Um, Simone, as I said, he has made the tough way seven years at Focke as a project manager, which is a kick off after university, I would say. Um, that's hard and tough learning from the very first day. Then 14 years you have been at the Lino Rook colleagues are here, as yeah. far as I've seen already. And uh, the last path of your career yeah, uh, has been years. a thorough, thorough sort of a company. Yeah. Also as head of facades. Yep. And you're on your next path uh, going yep. for that one. Yep. And uh, keep him uh, under control a little bit, see what he's doing on LinkedIn. Um, he's a real Italian. You will see it in the presentation. I promise you it will be fun. OK? OK. Yeah. Is it, Have is fun. It the guys will bring it on screen. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you very much. Let's see if I can get, okay. Um, the topic today was room with a view, glass, transparency, performances, uh, comfort, safety. Um, we've got a lot of dots to join, and I think the, we've got a tool, we need a tool to join these dots, which is competency. So I'm gonna talk about competency today, which is something we hear a lot about. Um, so we, we heard from, um, uh, interim report talking in the focus on, on um, competency and then the final report also had it the building safety act revolves around it and a number of frameworks being produced on competency by all parties and including the companies I work for and more recently some of us have been involved with the JCI which is the joint competency initiative for the building sector this has been published now and uh, so we we hear this drum we keep hearing this drum that's been what was that about um and again as, as you i come to this presentation this this with more questions also so forgive me for this it probably got more questions to you than um 
the, the other way around. So uh, normally we take inspiration from other industries. Uh, we like to compare the construction industry with the automotive industry. And I thought this time I want to do something different. I want to compare with the film industry. So I'm, I'm sure <laughs> this is a bit, I know it's a bit too far, I understand that, but I'm between jobs. So I'm, so I, I, I can do that now. I've, when is this going to happen again that I can do this? So. Um, there's a movie that's been around for many, many of you have seen. It's The Godfather, which is based on the uh, novel from Mario Puzo, and it's, uh, it had two of the greatest uh, actors we've had in recent times, and was published in 1972. Now, for this movie, there was um, there were of course auditions, and um, the two there were two two roles. The lead role was Michael, and Michael was the son of the um, the, the family. Um, uh, the, the, the big father, the godfather. And this role was already given to um, Al Pacino, a very well-known act actor at that time. But there was uh, auditions for the role. Was Michael's brother, was the younger brother, uh, irascible, uh, hot-tempered, um, a bit volatile. And so he, he, he will eventually he will never make it to be the boss because of his behavior. And behavior is not there, is not in red for for a coincidence. So for this role, uh, the script was very strong, it had some very strong words. Um, and basically, uh, Sonny is trying to tell Michael, who wants to leave the family, and wants to tell him, well, you are part of a family, you don't know what being part of a family means. So there are some very strong words. But we're all adults in the room, apart from my daughter, so please don't, don't read the, the bottom two lines. Um, so we, uh, this uh, audition, the role eventually went to James Caan, but there was an actor called Robert De Niro who went to the audition. And for this um, role, uh, for the audition, 4,000 people turned up and uh, Robert De Niro had a great, great grandfather who was Italian, but which he never met. And he didn't speak a single word of Italian language. So probably in our world, we would call this project a, a high risk project. He went anyway. So now if we can, if we can look at the audition, we're probably gonna see it a couple of times. Me and 400 other, 4,000 other people, or whatever we always came in. You're gonna take both of them, Mara and me. You're gonna take them, and you know what they're gonna do to you? And you know what you do when you knock somebody off? You take a gun, you shoot him right up against his fucking head. That's what you do. You get his, you get his brains all over your nice new Ivy League suit, Michael. That's what happens. How do you yeah, like that? It was huh? spectacular, but it was funny, really like killer, you know, like yeah. nothing you could ever sell. I know you can do it. All right, you prove it to me. You can do it. Go ahead, prove it. <laughs> Okay, so this is this is this is it. Now, why have I shown you this? Um, did it work? What, what do you think? Do you think did it did it work? Did it convince you? Uh, it did work. Not on this occasion, but eventually he won. Um, he got the role in this sequel of it, and he won a number of Oscars awards. Now, what I would like to ask you. What, what do you see from that audition? What do you see from Robert De Niro there? I see a number of things, lots of things. So I'm expecting to be bombarded by your views. Why, what has this got to do with competence? You know, when, when we talk about competence, we always try to use the SCAB sort of um, approach. So it's skills, knowledge, experience, and behavior. And I think all of these aspects are covered by what this guy is doing here. So just to, to name a few, I think there's talent, obviously. Um, I think there's an intuition in understanding that he was playing the role of, of an Italian. So he tries to say something in Italian, he tries to move his hands. Uh, we do move his hands, uh, our hands Italian. There's sensitivity, he understands what the role is about. Um, I think it's far-sighted, it's, it's, um, he, he, he believes he could do everything, he knows what the role is about. And, and I would call, call these under skill category. Of course he studied, of course he practiced a lot. Uh, an audition like this doesn't come up on an uh, improvisation on a day. He knew what the agenda was, he knew what the uh, role was about and what the director wanted. And how many times he, has he rehearsed it? 
I think is raised a number of times and perfect, made it perfect. So this, it's probably knowledge. He wasn't a youngster. He was already 29 year old. So he had already played in many roles, uh, although he hadn't be, uh, hit the great success, but he had graduated from a very famous uh, actor's school. So he had experience. And also I would call under behavior, I would put passion. You can definitely see passion. You can see courage. It's very brave for someone to go in front of a director with 4,000 people well, go in there already, 4,000 people say, well, I'm going to get the role. Um, focus and drive. So I think this is what it's got, what we see in terms of. And I think this, these four things, is exactly what we call uh, competence. So now going back to us, um, what has this got to do with glazing? Now, we've talked about skills. Now, we'll think about some, some case studies. Talking about skills, there's this job. You all know this job. Um, what you may not know is that one of the challenges was uh, um, trying to limit the uh, movement of the building during the construction stage because as the uh, structure goes up, uh, it moves uh, with the weight of the building. Initially, the structural engineer suggested presets, so basically thinking that the, the structure will move, will lean in one direction, we preset it in the other direction, so it will eventually end up being there or thereabout. Uh, but this, um, involved a tolerance of about 75 millimeters, which was a bit, a way, a bit too much. So during the tender stage, um, this is Langlois Walk, of course, uh, thank, uh, thanks to the intuition, the talent of a phenomenal structure engineer and the combination of um, uh, facade engineers and structure engineers working together, the active alignment was uh, produced. This is a tender stage and then it became uh, a reality. What is the active alignment? So basically when the structure is being built, as, and the facade installed, uh, some uh, glazed areas were left out, so, and the connections were left loose. So when the building, um, during the erection of the following phases, started moving, it could be jacked back into position, into its nominal position, and then the fixing tighten, and then the facade completed. Um, so this allowed the, 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 the building, the, the Leadenhall building has been built at zero tolerances. It's exactly in its nominal position. Um, so that is one result of competence, I would say. Um, another example could be knowledge, uh, knowing uh, agendas and uh, priorities and what is important, not only uh, for the um, main contractor, subcontractor, or the uh, architect, but, but also for architect and the end user. You probably know this job, it's the uh, American Air Museum in Duxford, and this was delivered in, in my old days at uh, Focke when I was um, young, much younger than now. It's a Sir Norman Foster's job, a uh, very iconic building, and it's an uh, exhibition of um, American aircraft uh, used in World War II. Um, the building is iconic and it's got a fully glazed facade. The, um, the owner of the building wanted to have the possibility to uh, change and replace some of these aircrafts, uh, some of which are, uh, obviously um, behind the glazed facade, some of which are hanging from the roof. So this was resolved again with a combination of uh, combined effort of structural engineer and facade engineers with this design. So all these mullions, which are shaped, I've got the shape of the bending moment, are hinged at the bottom. They've got these hinged, they're still mullions, they're cold plates. They're hinged at the bottom and they've got a pin at the top, up here. Of course, that takes all the um, movements because the, the, there's a long story about the roof um, but the, the, there was a lots of um, these are precast planks designed by Arab and the, the, the whole structure was propped and only when the last piece was placed in place the roof could could be self-supporting so there was a lot of movement expected in reality it behaved much better than expected anyway um, in case the the uh, owner had to replace the airplanes then all these, um, let's see if you go back one, all these pins at the top could be removed, the whole facade lowered down, aircraft taken out, and then new ones blown back in. This has happened. I was told this has happened about two or three years ago. Um, so it has worked. So again, this is uh, what competence allowed uh, and allowed this, uh, the client to um, 
deliver his uh, requirements. Uh, the next one is on lessons learned, and we're probably deviating a little bit from glass here, but this is something important. Um, this is a job in Woking, a project you probably know, just finished. Um, it's a very large development for Woking. It's two resi towers, a car park, uh, a shopping centre at the bottom, and um, a Hilton Hotel. What you probably see, <laughs> there's something missing here. And what happened was that a couple of panels became detached, nothing happened, nothing major, but was major for the main contractor because it was a big safety hazard, a big safety risk. And since then, uh, what was introduced was, this is what you would normally see in an induction room for installers, glass, curtain walling, um, rain screen, any, um, any type of curtain walling. What, what you don't see is what's in the back there, which is, um, exam area. So uh, the, there's a, a visual mock-up, a performance mock-up, uh, installers are given the theory and then they're showing practically how to install the panel and then they will have to pass the exam by installing it themselves downstairs rather than on the building. And then one last thing and then um, I hope I'm catching up with, with time is uh, on uh, courage. Uh, and this is a question really for you. In all our projects, we've got structural engineers. At concept design, we've got a structural engineer for the project uh, who's also involved with the early design, tender stage, the detailed design, and eventually he's involved on site. So for all this time, we've got the project structural engineer. So I'm wondering why do we, and when I say we, it's, it's a royal we, it's the, the industry, ask facade engineers or facade subcontractors to run wind load calculations when they come probably at this stage here, um, late in the process and knowing very little about the project. Is, is, it, uh, is it the best use of resources and knowledge and are we getting the best result? Having said this, I've got more questions than answers, so I'm opening to you probably to give answers rather than ask the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Thank you so much. But I, I did not promise too much, it's really Italian. Uh, when it comes to the, the way of presenting and doing things, passion, emotion, everything is in. Um, just a question, why are so many facade people Italians? Number of reasons. First of all, because Italian are good people, good engineers. Uh, no, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's a couple of big companies uh, and a, a few a smaller good ones, subcontractor based in Italy. Also, in the universities in Italy, there's a degree in uh, architectural engineering, which is not particularly um, good for anything, other than it gives you a bit of everything. You know, building physics, uh, mechanical engineering, structural engineering, and architecture. So when a young engineer comes out of university, um, he goes into facade, there's beautiful architecture, mm -hmm. and there's topics that he, he knows about. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to find good engineers, good facade engineers, and there's some very good universities like Polytechnic in Milan or in Turin that um, prepare good people. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Right, questions from the audience? Yeah. Last but not least, what is your view about transparency? On um, transparency, I think we have to learn um, uh, that uh, combine transparency with glass recycling. Okay. That is that is okay. what that is the target, I believe. Okay. This is more or less the next challenge to decarbonize the industry. Okay. Th that's where we are. Looking okay. forward to. It. Thanks, Alcimo. Thank morning. you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having you here. Thank you. Okay. And now it's the turn of a lady. I mean, you need the architect to have the view, the vision, the activity. Uh, thinking about transparency for inside, outside, from architecture point of view, but also for the occupants point of view. You need a facade engineer being able to get more or less, more or less nothing right, but everything under control. Uh, as just learned by Simone, you need a structural engineer, but at the end you need someone who is doing it. You need someone who is capable to install the dream of the architect, the structural engineering, the facade planner's specification. Yeah. I'm so happy to have uh, Rebecca Clayton here from IQ Glass, uh, Amersham, being our exclusive partner in UK markets and some other areas of the world as well, right. uh, giving us more or less the real good pitch about why it's good to be in this industry, why more or less this room with a view is something really challenging, but also rewarding when it comes to the daily work. Rebecca is, I learned it 11 years now yeah. at IQ. This I... is a record. Which not, is a, uh, not a record. Not a record? No. Nearly. Nearly. Yeah. You, st <laughs> yeah. you started in marketing as a manager, then you became director already. 
And yeah. now you take in addition all the communication marketing things under control. So lovely to have you with us and looking forward for your room Great. with a view. Thank you very much. How to make it happen. Yes. So, um, so obviously the concept was room with a view. And so as a glazing company, that's a big part of what we do. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is if you've got a room with a view, and you want to use transparency to maximize that, what are the things that you have to look at and think about? Um, so this is a room with a view. This is a house in London. And one of the things, the, one of the first challenges is to minimize the vertical sight lines that you see. So the things that you see vertically in that elevation. If you've got fixed glazing, you can use structural glazing. That's one of the ways that you can um, uh, uh, maximize that view. Um, with this type of glass connection, uh, you've got a black structural silicon joint um, that connects the glass panels together. Um, if you want to use opening elements, um, then you can still maintain a really, really similar sight line um, about between 21 and 26 millimeters um, of framing between the moving um, glass panels. And that's something that we do uh, with Keller. Um, the glass units can be double or triple glazed, but the key for this type of system, if you're gonna use a really slim frame sliding door system, what you want is to make sure it's structurally bonded. And the reason for that is that it minimizes um, the frame that you see in that view by removing the need for a glazing bead. A very traditional window and door system would have an L-shaped frame. You put the glass in, you clip a glazing bead over it, but then that's also visible. So by removing the need for a glazing bead, structurally bonding it into the frame, you bring all of that sight line down. The next area of framing that you want to try and reduce is what's going on at the head and the base. Um, so this was a project um, uh, called Grave Time Manor. Um, again, beautiful view over the gardens um, from the listed manor house. Um, and so you want to um, uh, provide that connection between inside and outside. Um, and you can do that by removing all of the frame at the base. Um, there are a number of different ways uh, that you can do that. These are just a couple of base examples um, um, from a few different um, sliding door systems. Just showing what's possible. Um, this is um, a classic minimal windows system from Keller. Um, and it has about a two centimeter um, framing that comes up above the finished floor level. Um, when you actually install it in um, uh, real life and you're using big size panels um, and you've got large elevations of glazing, you don't normally read it and it matches the vertical sight line. Um, however, if you do want to get rid of that completely, the new NGS view um, system, has managed, uh, they've managed to engineer it so that all of that framing comes right down below the finished floor level. So all you see is a five millimeter gasket um, at the base. And so this um, uh, m absolutely maximizes the floor to ceiling glass. Another base option that we get asked for quite often by architects, and I'm sure that they get asked for by their clients, is to have this, um, what's called an invisible base, where the floor finishes are brought over the top of that base. Um, but we have to consider that we live in the UK and it's wet and it's windy and we have leaves. So a lot of the sliding door systems you see that have these invisible bases with slots in the floor, um, uh, it's a slot in the floor and all the wheels and the rails and everything is underneath the floor finish. So if a leaf got in there, if a stone got in there, you would have to start pulling up floor finishes in order to get into it and try and fix it. So um, the alternative option for doing all of that um, is with the NGS floor system. Um, so this is what you saw in that image previously. So it's a two cent to three centimeter slot in the floor. Um, but the way that this has been engineered by Keller is that you can still access the rail and the wheel when the doors are in action. Um, and that means that you don't have to tear out all the building finishes uh, in order to access it. The downside sometimes of these invisible base systems is that you do get a little bit more framing above the finished floor level. Uh, one of the things that you can do, um, which for the, the guys in the room here, there is a sample of it, I'm told, um, on the side that you can have a look at at the end, um, is that you can step the double or triple glazed unit, step the glass over the base frame, and so that you get a sheer glass elevation inside and outside to minimize that frame, and it reduces the sight line down to 16 millimeters. This only really works if you've got a dark colored frame um, because the step that you get at the bottom um, is black. Uh, so if you've got a silver or a light colored frame, it won't really work. Um, but uh, if you're looking to try and minimize that base frame and use the invisible um, base track um, and then end up with this kind of result, then you can use that stepped profile as well. The other um, frontier of framing that you can try and reduce uh, is the locking profile. 
So um, typically, um, this is a really typical locking system for a really slim frame sliding door. Uh, you can see the um, picture on the side, that's a project uh, that we did with um, uh, De Draft uh, called the AC Residence. And um, typically, the locking profile that you can see here where it meets the wall, you have to have this exposed. It's about four centimeters of framing. Um, you have to have it exposed because you need to touch it, you need to hold it, you need to be able to open and close the, the lock um, and interact with it. Whereas there is an option now that you can completely remove that um, and get rid of it. This is the um, new locking um, detail, the hidden handy handle detail from the NGS system. And what you're able to do now is completely sync that whole T-section locking profile into the wall finish. And you're bringing all of the wall finishes over the top. Um, let's see if I can get this. Uh, if this video works, there we go. Um, so how it actually works is it's got an integrated, very small motor in it. So you press the motor and it pops the door out of the wall and then you can grab it and open and close it manually. And then when you want to close it, you pull it manually to a certain point and then the motor pulls it um, into the wall finish and then it creates a completely frameless finish at that locking profile. So then if you've got a really slim vertical sight line and you've got the NGS view, let's say, so you're taking away all the head frame um, base, um, head and frame um, framing, and then you're using the hidden handle as well, then uh, within the elevation, you can get the glass to 99.3% um, of that elevation um, and minimize all of the framing that you've got on there as well. Um, the um, other thing that you want to do if you want to try and um, uh, maximize your view, if you've got a room with a view, is maximizing the size of the glass units that you can use. Uh, it will depend on lots of logistics on the project as to what the maximum size of glass you can use is. We do lots of projects in very, very hard to reach places and you have to look at what are the weights of the, that can go over the bridges on the lead up to the building. Um, but if there are no logistical concerns whatsoever. Um, six meters by three meters is a very typical um, glass size that you can get in most places. There are um, toughening plants and glass processing um, uh, um, factories that we work with who can toughen glass that's 20 meters by 3.5. Um, so that's all very possible. Um, if you are looking at a moving part though, you do have to think about the physics of how that moves. Um, this is a really, uh, useful um, uh, project example of a project we did quite a few years ago in London. Um, so this is a, a just under six meter tall sliding door to this rear elevation in London. Um, and typically when you've got a sliding door, you don't want them to be too tall and narrow um, because otherwise they will judder um, across the tracks. Um, a rule of thumb is you don't want the width of the sliding door to be less than a third of the height. Um, and that's normally what the what convention um, says. However, on this project, it was really important to the architects and the design that the doors were very tall and very narrow. Um, so what we did on this project is we've got the normal rail, the wheels and the rail at the base of the sliding door. And what we've done is then mirrored that on the top of the sliding door and essentially clamped the sliding door between two um, uh, rail and wheel systems. And that allows um, the panel that is on the um, left of the installation to slide manually back and forth whilst being about six meters tall um, and very narrow as well. When you are looking to maximize the size of glazing, um, and especially as we start to move towards a little bit more of triple glazing um, on projects, these glass units are gonna get heavier. And when you're looking at a sliding door system, the rails and the wheels are designed to take weights of 1,500 kilograms. So the system can deal with that. However, the person that's pushing it and having to open and close the sliding doors might not be able to open 1,500 kilograms of glass at a time. Um, so when automation is required, uh, will depend on the user. It is a little bit subjective, but um, at IQ, we would start talking about automation if the glass unit started weighing over 500 kilograms. That's when we would start to um, talk about you might wanna consider um, automating some of these doors. Um, if you are looking at automation, there's again, a few different options. You've got a classic um, linear drive, um, and that tends to be a box that's fixed to the inside face of the frame. Um, and that's where all the motor is. And the motor runs the entire length down the sliding door elevation. The downside on sometimes on these projects is that if you've got curtains or blinds, uh, this is where they tend to go. So they can cause a clash there. Uh, it can also interrupt the building finishes because you don't want to bring the build finishes all the way over the motor casing in case you need to access it over time. Um, so there's a, an update on this now is the um, option of what's called the top slider. 
Um, and so there you're integrating the motor into the head frame of the sliding door instead of um, bolting it to the inside of the frame. Um, so it means you can bring your building finishes all the way up to the inside of the frame so you can maintain that floor to ceiling glass elevation. It adds about three centimetres on the top of the frame, but that's much easier to build into um, a structural opening than having that box on the inside as well. The other thing that the top slider allows you to do is um, something that's called uh, telescopic um, automation. So typical linear automation, um, you're pushing and pulling the lead panel um, of the sliding glass door. Um, and so the, the glass units move one at a time, something like this. And then they open like that. Whereas telescopic automation, the motor is pre-designed in the factory. It knows the weights, it knows the lengths of the drive and each sliding glass unit moves simultaneously, reaches its open and closed position at the same time. Um, so it's a much smoother and more natural um, sliding action. You also don't get that banging um, that you can sometimes get if you've got a linear drive, it's pushing and pulling the, the, the lead panel. Um, and when the sliding door is uh, closing, it grabs the end panel and that can cause a bit of a bang. Whereas with the telescopic um, uh, automation, you remove all of that um, as well. If you are looking at these types of elevations and you've got a room, again, with a view, um, you've minimized all of the framework, you've maximized the size of glass that you want. Now you want to make sure that that glass elevation is going to perform um, uh, to how you need it to. Um, so step one of performance, here, the first question we tend to ask about is thermal performance. That can dictate quite a lot um, uh, of uh, the rest of the glazing design. So what thermal performance is needed from the glazing? Um, one of the things that I think not many people or um, uh, not everybody is aware of is that there is this um, sometimes a misconception that, oh, well, I want to minimize, I want to um, uh, improve the thermal performance of this window, so I'm going to make it smaller. Whereas uh, what you can see on this chart here, so this shows the um, UW value of the NGS4, which is the blue line, and the NGS6, um, and it's using a UG um, of, uh, unit um, of 0 0.5. Um, and you can see that as the glass sizes increase, the thermal performance actually improves. So the, the overall UW value of the installation actually gets better. And that's because the thermal performance of the glass of the installation is the best performing part. Um, so the larger the glass sizes that you use in that elevation, then the better the overall thermal performance of the installation is. The other um, frontier of um, thermal performance uh, is also the wind loading as well. You've got not got a lot of framing um, in this elevation at all. Uh, you've got very high specification glazing that gives you the strength um, uh, in these types of elevations. And then that vertical profile between the sliding glass units uh, is acting as a wind post uh, between them. Now, if you've got an area that's got a very, very high wind load, so we've like this villa that we did down here in Barbados, we've worked in the Bahamas, they've got very, very high hurricane levels um, of uh, wind and water resistance that we have to achieve. Uh, one way that some systems do it is you make this vertical profile deeper. So it moves away from the glazing. That gives a bit of a deeper um, uh, profile and it gives a little bit more stability to it. The downside of that is that when you look at the glazing at an angle, you're gonna read quite a deep profile. So what we try to do is minimize that depth as much as possible. And this detail here is showing a steel plate in the middle um, of that, of the hollow aluminium section. And this is a way that we can try and reinforce uh, the interlocker to achieve really high wind loads. So this is a project that we did it in Morgan Porth down in Cornwall. Uh, it was quite a complex build in terms of the wind loading because it had all of these different volumes uh, within the structure. And uh, some areas of the glazing on this project had wind loads um, uh, of uh, 3.4 kilonewtons per meter squared. And so what we did is we used that reinforced uh, interlock and that allowed us to maintain the 21 mil sight line even on the direct coastal um, facing elevations as well. So you've minimized the frame, you've maximized the glass, you're making sure that it's gonna perform. And now you wanna make sure that the glass fits into the building that you're designing rather than trying to fit the building around the design. Um, my, one, my first key suggestion would be start thinking about the glazing design at a relatively early stage um, of the project because if you start consulting um, a glazier 
later on in the project, you might have to um, uh, change what you were wanting to have because other decisions have already been made. Um, but with these types of systems, structural glazing or slim frame sliding doors, really the design flexibility is quite broad. Um, so opening corners are very, very possible. Any angle between 65 to 177 degrees is very, very possible. Um, this is a project example showcasing you can apply different finishes to the glazing. So this project here was a wedding venue and they applied um, a finish on here to create the appearance of a glazing bar design um, on the sliding doors. Pocket doors are also really um, uh, possible to do. The one thing that I would suggest if you're ever going to use a pocket door um, is make sure that you finish the inside of the pocket because when all of the sliding doors are slid into it, you're looking through glass that's transparent and the last thing you want to see is exposed stud walls um, and that type of thing. Um, installing the glass at an angle um, might seem a bit weird, but this was a project in London where part of the, a key part of the design was that the glass box at the back um, lent out from the building very slightly. Um, had to do a little bit of work with the rails at the base, but now it is possible to do that. You can also see from the bottom image that you can also have these, the sliding doors don't have to be square. You can see there's a bit of a raked edge on a couple of these to fit into the shape of the structure. And again, that's all very possible to do. And um, the very last um, uh, um, example uh, is why don't you turn the sliding doors completely on their head and slide them up and down instead of side to side. So the top um, uh, video is a video of our showroom in Amersham. What we've done is taken the Keller sliding door and made it slide vertically up and down and created a 6.5 metre tall glass elevation. Um, the bottom image here for the project we did in Guernsey this is a two pane version of that. The bottom panel of glass is fixed, designed for a line load um, to create a Juliet balcony. The windows are about five, uh, four meters wide and the top panel of glass sinks down and then you create a full four meter wide um, Juliet balcony um, for the master bedrooms. Um, so yes, that's uh, if you've got a room with a view, maximize it with decent glazing, basically. <laughs> I guess not, not too much more or less uh, uh, to be said. I mean, it's really impressive about the projects you did worldwide. Uh, uh, high wind loads, uh, when yeah. it comes to that kind of aesthetics, it's part of the architecture which is demanded and needed. And the really brilliantly summarized more or less activities on IQ and the capabilities of IQ in the industry. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, it, to the 11 years in this industry okay. you're facing, um, what keeps you in this industry? What makes you happy every morning to go up and jump into the car to go to the office? Um, we've got a really good coffee machine. <laughs> um, no, uh, we, we are very, very lucky that we get to work. Um, the types of products that we do lend themselves to really interesting architectural projects. So we get approached by architects all over the world and you know it's the designs that they come up with and then we have to try and figure out how we're gonna make this work. And then I get to look all the, once all the project managers and the facade engineers and the architects and the project managers have done all the hard work, I get to look at the pretty pictures at the end and say, oh, that looks really nice. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's There was no hassle, it was just no. brilliant. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Any questions? No questions. Rebecca, one question. Yeah, oh. one. How do you power the invisible handrail? Say that again, sorry. Oh, so it's electric, but that can be formed from um, um, formed from whatever um, electrical source you want. Um, you'd know a little bit more about it than I would. Well, within any automation, there's always a battery backup. Um, so yes, there will be. Yeah. And you have a famous small button where you completely unlock the drive. Okay. In the case of. In yeah. case you need to. Yeah. 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 Hi. What you can do with um, the minimal window system is you can use a system that's called slot eration, and I'll have to try and explain it using my hands because um, I don't have any details. So um, uh, how the locking system works is when the um, T-section is slid into the wall, uh, you turn a thrust lever handle or turn a key and it sends steel shoot bolts into a hole that's made in the ceiling and the floor um, as part of the frame. What you could do with slot eration is you have three of them um, all in a row. So you can pull the sliding door very slightly out of the wall and lock it in a ventilated position um, and so it's got a 20 millimeter and a 40 millimeter ventilation gap um, so if you need to integrate ventilation into the slim frame slider 
that's the way to do it. Um, but a lot of the projects that we work on, because the, the design of these systems is that you hide most of the frame away, there's no way that you can ventilate through the frame itself. Um, so you either use slot aeration or it's um, um, some form of ventilation system within the building, typically. Okay? Lovely. Right. Rebecca, well made. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Yeah. Last but not least, I said we had the architect, we had the facade engineer, we had the person who is doing the job at the end with all the dreams and ideas of the specification of the design of whatsoever. And you also mentioned some very nice projects with a high wind exposure. Um, and uh, this is the reason why also Damon is with us. <laughs> Damon from Eckersley O'Callaghan, I mean, all of you know him. He is more or less the head of facade at Eckersley O'Callaghan and uh, we came across also many times over the past years and just recently because sometimes you think when you when you think minimalistic uh, it is just a small apartment store and that's it. Um, I mean we have had uh, just in the last couple of weeks several projects to be discussed also very tall buildings um, curved uh, sliders, having more or less more than six meters of height, as you did already, uh, Rebecca, together with the IQ team. So it's, it's pretty important to have a good structural engineer in your backhand just uh, to make not stupid yeah. decisions when you go into a project. So help us on that one, uh, Damien. Uh, Eckers Leo Callahan, I mean, you know it by heart in here in London. Very famous, at least for me, very famous, the Apple Store Avenue, number five in New York. Yeah. Steve Jobs Theater. I mean, iconic buildings, pure glass, no nothing but glass and transparency. So these are rooms with a view. Yep. Damien, looking forward to your okay. definition. Um, and I'm going to be questioning some of that. Yeah. Uh, I will just some of those that one. projects. It will, you'll think that Fabian and I coordinated our presentations because there's a lot of overlap, but, but we didn't. Um, so a room with you. This is our view from, from our office, or it, you can, the skyline's it's a few years old, there's been a few buildings added to that. And unfortunately, they've built some terrible uh, blocks of flats in front of this to spoil the view, but at least that's, that's what it was. And keep that in mind. Um, the, this, this is a building that we completed uh, a few months ago in Hong Kong. Um, and it's a, it's a Hong Kong client, but it really could be you know, anywhere in the world that this is really what our clients in commercial office buildings are looking for a lot of the time. Floor to ceiling glass. Full transparency. This is three meter wide uh, unitized system. A little bit tighter at the corner. Some curved panels, but you can you can just about make out. And this is this is why because they've got this. This is um, an amazing view uh, at this height that they want to take advantage of. Um, and yeah, and then you can you can you can see particularly this view in the corner uh, going looking back towards central Hong Kong. It's really it's really spectacular. The the kind of architecture that this goes with and you know the kind of consequence of this amount of transparency in the facade is that, is that you it's that the glass it's an all glass building and um and you can you can see around it you know it's a it's a variation and it's an improvement on what was done before but it's a um it's it's a it's a family it's a kind of architecture that we see has been evolving particularly in the last few years this is almost seen often as sort of 20th century architecture and, and uh, all glass buildings. And it's a, it's, it's a symbol of where we need to move, you know, move on from this to more energy efficient buildings. And, um, and by contrast, this is something that we've just completed it's about two, 300 meters up the road uh, from here on City Road. And this this is a type of architecture that we're seeing a lot more of in London these days, which is a lot less glass. Um, it's you know fifty percent, I think, um, glass in this in this example. It's really beautifully um, detailed, uh, d variety of materials. It's, you know, it's very rich. Um, I think uh, aesthetically, uh, this facade, but um, but you know the the glazing, glazing potential is is less internally. It's a very different feeling. Um, the, it's, I think, more inward focused uh, space. You don't have that connection to the outside. Uh, another one, this isn't one that we've been involved in, but it's an example I'm, I'm aware of, of a, a high rise in, um, in Sweden where the regulations, the energy codes there, which are really focused on U value and sort of winter heat loss, have minimized the, the, the amounts of 
glass that you're allowed to have in facades to about 30, 35%. So, you know, it's, it, it, you, again, you're kind of losing that connection, I think, to the outside. And it's, although you do get a view, you know, in this picture, it, I think, again, it becomes a much more sort of inward looking um, place and, uh, and, and you're losing that connection. So, you know, if we take that office that we had in, in Hong Kong, the beautiful view, and, you know, we tighten if that's 50%, if that's our Featherstone building, or if that's the Swedish project, okay, you're still getting a view, but I think that it's, 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 very, it's very much compromised. Um, and again, it didn't coordinate this with Caribbean, but, you know, we, we kind of know the, the intellectually, you know, and the, 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 his, the historic um, context of where this has come from, and uh, Fabian eloquently described it, it's sort of dematerializing um, facades and creating that pure connection to the outside. But, but you know, v from very early on, I mean, this is from the, from the 60s, we've kind of known that those buildings didn't really perform, um, it, like the all glass uh, building, the, old, the, the full transparency was never really possible because um, they weren't comfortable. It's not, just, not even just we're talking about energy performance and decarbonization now, they, they, they often weren't comfortable. So you had to introduce dark glass for reflective glass, um, tinted glass in order to, to make them work. And so, so we're always faced with this. Well, how do we, how do we balance views, uh, views out, that connection to the outside, the good daylight inside, which we want. We don't want the overheating. We don't want the glare. Um, and there's something that's kind of fundamentally um, in conflict uh, with, with, between these two these two desires that we have. And if you kind of, if we flip it the other way, there's a, there's a conflict between energy use and, and minimizing energy consumption and, uh, and thermal comfort uh, of people who are in the building who are suffering from overheating and the visual comfort of their um, you know, ability to, to carry on with their sort of their, their tasks um, inside the office. So, um, and, you know, we're, we're developing and, you know, our, our, our peers um, are developing, um, you know, sophisticated tools to, to understand this, to measure it. And, you know, we, we've now got, you know, scripts uh, that we're, we've, we've built that we can measure uh, and, and assess overheating, glare risk, daylight inside a, inside a building for a variety of, of you know, facade solutions. Um, and you know, and we and we know there's another building we completed recently nearby. You can have an all glass facade with a, a layer of um, of shading on it, which can actually perform very well, and it can be comfortable um, for, uh, to 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 users, um, and can be very beautiful. But you know, there's, there's, there is a compromise. There's a comp the, the view is somewhat compromised here, and you know, there still is going to be some some glare uh, at, at times. So. You know, there's a kind of fundamental question I think was, we're asking with, with a view and with building performance and what, we, what we're trying to do to, Im to improve building performance, do we have to compromise? Do we have to compromise on the amount of glass? Um, and uh, I'm, th there's, uh, well, I guess what I'm gonna say is, probably, is no, I think, I think is, is what we need to get to. And there's, there's solutions out there that mean that we have to compromise less where they're appropriate. Uh, double skin, closed cavity facades, dynamic glass. Um, there's you know a number of products that are that are available. Those are you know get, becoming more affordable, becoming more reliable. Um, movable external shades. There's some you know some examples of that. Internal reflective blinds. I think is something that is really underutilized um, in uh, in certainly in the UK. Um, and those these uh, you know the, the CCF and the and the the reflective blinds. I think are um, are uncomplicated, um, relatively, and 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 very effective solutions that mean that we have to you know compromise a lot less. Um, so, uh, and you know this is a this again an Arab project actually in Wilkinson that we weren't involved in but had the privilege to to see last week. And you this is a hundred percent glazed facade externally. Um, but with a dynamic facade with integrated blinds um, that, that can bring you a G value of below 10% um, when they're down, but still get 100% glazing when, when they're up. And the, when they're down, again, something, you know, there's 
technologies and, and blinds that will actually improve your daylight performance within that building because they're they're reflective they can redirect the light onto the onto the ceiling now you know why why do we think that that now is the time for for dynamic facades um well i think we've all seen over the last few years there's a variable use of buildings our offices aren't full all the time um you know our homes our, our offices you know the, this assumptions that we had about the use of building is very different and we need buildings to be able to adapt to the varying use. There's a gaping gap in performance for how our buildings are predicted to perform and how they're actually performing. I think this is, is a kind of connection with, uh, between these things about the, the use, but also um, I think we just, uh, th this whole idea of, of a static facade that is going to perform you know, ideally at every, uh, you know, throughout the year, just doesn't, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a false idea that we've kind of stuck to. And we need to, we need to move on from that if we're going to really address the, the climate crisis. Um, adaptation to, to future climate, you know, we're build, building and designing facades now that are going to last for 50 years, but the, the climate in 50 years is going to be very different to the climate we have. And also we need to have resilience to extreme temperatures. Even, even now we've got you know, heat waves in Europe um, that have never been experienced. And how do we, um, how do we have our facades be able to cope with that? And I think that these dynamic solutions are, are, are really gonna be part of that. Now part of that, something that I think that we don't talk about enough in, in these you know, complex facades is just a simple idea is natural ventilation. There's lots of ways to naturally ventilate buildings. Um, it's not a it's not a new technology, um, but it, it, it's something that I think is underutilized in the design of buildings. So it's taken for granted that you might have an opening window, but have you actually designed the systems, the internal systems, to be optimized for that factor that, that there's natural ventilation and to and to make use of it? Um, this is a, a building which is uh, in the ground. Is we started um, construction in the of the foundations in in Sydney earlier this year. Um, it's a 40-story uh, tower, timber hybrid structure. Uh, we've done the structure and facade. But a key feature of it is this, these habitats in, internally, which are, uh, which are naturally ventilated. And this is quite rare for, for a 40-story building to, to be naturally ventilated. And, and the, the way that this, this has been um, allowed to work is that these park spaces around the outside, which bring, um, bring fresh air so you're not, you don't have such issues of, of the, the direct air coming onto the workspaces. They're always, it's this sort of buffer zone around the perimeter of the building, which is on, on two elevations of the building, which are naturally ventilated. Then all of the workspaces draw the air off of that. Um, with working with Transolar, who, who have analyzed the, the, you know, the, the climate and really taken advantage of adaptive comfort, which is a, uh, kind of principle that you're more comfortable if there's air moving over your skin that you're so you can actually um, accept higher air temperatures if there's air moving past you and this is a, a key feature of sort of natural ventilation that we don't think about we just design for a static space might let there be an open window but you don't you don't really take advantage of that if you really do take advantage of it they found that there's sort of 90 91 percent of the year that natural ventilation was possible. And by doing that, they could, they, they reduced the amount of cooling provided to the building by 50%. And that was a, that was a key step in, in, you know, the brief that we had from our client was to make this, this building a 50% less embodied carbon, 50% less operational carbon than a traditional um, Sydney tower. And through the timber hybrid structure, we managed that on the structural side and on the operational side, that was done principally by using natural ventilation with adaptive cooling. Um, so, this is the same story, and of, um, you know, thanks, thanks to Keller for hosting us. This is this is the sort of solution that we we need to be thinking about, not just on those kind of high-rise signature projects like that, but really in in domestic buildings and in in homes. Um, there's the UK last year brought in uh, the, one of the first countries to to bring in a, a standard for overheating. Um, in, in buildings that you, you know, that for planning, for, for building regulations, that you need to study the overheating of that space. And, and re, you know, the answer it's pointing us towards is better natural ventilation in, in buildings. We're, we're seeing 
that there's if we don't do anything um, about the um, uh, if, if we don't provide passive uh, means to address overheating in spaces, then, then the, the need for air conditioning in buildings is going, to, is going to skyrocket over the coming decades. So this is really something that we need to be thinking about and designing buildings to take advantage of that. We published a, a, a piece with uh, Introba, uh, MEP, sustainability engineers, uh, a month ago, um, talking about you know how how we think this can be done, and you know, as a, a thought piece to to provoke ideas from people to think about both the possibilities of, of natural ventilation in buildings and how to design facades to to make it possible. So um, look that up. I wanted to put a QR code here, but I didn't get time. Um, anyway, you can find it on on our website and in Trovers. And that's it. Done. Enjoy the view. Brilliant. Shocked you Brilliant. with my Fantastic. with my good time piecing. Yeah. Super cool. Super cool. It was a yeah. lot of building physics part of it. How 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 much is this building physics more important than the structural part of Eckers Leo Keller? Ah, uh, that's a that's a, a controversial question. Um, I, I office, think or yeah <laughs> yeah. It it it's. I mean, it's at the. I would say in our office the kind of glass and understanding of glass mm. as a material and how to use it is is very much in our, in our DNA. Mm. And that's challenging, um, you know, an absence of codes and understanding things from the fundamental level. I think we, we will always have that love of glass as a material. And, you know, and as I say, the, the, the views and the connection to nature and the connection to indoors and outdoors, I think is really important. But yeah, it occupies a lot of our mind. How do we do that? How do we still not just justify the projects that, that we've done, yeah, but really how do, what's the future of glass yeah. in our industry? And it has a really important yeah. role, but it has to be, a, you know, it has to be used responsibly and in, in the right way. And, you know, and questions about recycling and you know, circularity are all part of this. And that really, that, that occupies a lot of our okay. Um, sort okay. of so minds. So the, the answer is not to reduce the glass to 20% of the building envelope or no, it can't no. be. It, it can't, can't be. be. Yeah. Then no one's going to like those buildings. Yeah. So we'll be demolishing them. Exactly. So it's more out of the occupancy view. Uh, important to think about the glass part. Yeah. In it. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 you know and what else can, what else can we do with it to make the, you know to to compensate. Exactly. And that's ventilation. Yeah. It's it's shading systems. It's kind of doing more with less. I always say this. It's like you've got internal blinds. Mm -hmm. Can we just change that to a different spec that's going to actually work for us. If you've got a window, can we like use that to, you know, to make it more comfortable? Okay. okay. But, but you and your job, you're also going more and more into this kind of lifetime investigation of materials, including this shading parts, just to get the best option installed and maybe not the lowest cost one. Is this the, the uh, uh, Yeah. We kind of want the lowest cost, but it has to, but it has to last. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And there's no good okay. designing something no good again, replacing in yeah. 15 years. Yeah. It's lovely. Thanks a lot, Damien. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just be with us, uh, Fabian, Rebecca, good morning. Plus, please come on stage for the audience here, but of course for the audience at home. Uh, just great, great thank you uh, from our side here from London, from Keller Minimal Windows, from our teammates Alok here in the UK, giving us the opportunity to be with you here. It's uh, really a grateful event. Uh, looking forward to have much more of these events with us. And it was a brilliant afternoon with you. Thank you so much for your preparation and really, really excellent presentations done. Fabian Hecker, Sahadin Architects, gave us the inspiration about the view from an architect's perspective. Rebecca Clayton from IQ Glass gave us the opportunity to understand somehow it must be built and how it can be built. She knows it. She gives a lot of CPDs in the UK to really teach and bring this competence of IQ Glass into the market. Damien, we know by heart, having a lot of efforts uh, done on the structure, but also on the building physics part, and now also even more on the complete life cycle assessment from Eckers Leo Callahan and Simone Stanini, a back, back uh, a pack of uh, competencies in this industry on facade engineering. Thanks a lot, all of you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, Thank you so much. So.
the chapter zone, I mean, you can just uh, stay and watch us drinking a little bit of sparkling water, of course. Um, the bar is open. Uh, we'll have just to grab a little bit to drink now, talking to each other. And of course, we have a little bit food prepared at a later stage. Thank you so much for being with us. Brilliant to meet you again. Looking forward to see you soon again here in this location. We'll come much more often, I promise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoy the evening. Yeah.